My name's Aaron. I'm here at the LDS General Conference. We're here at the corner of Main Street and North Temple. And we have street preachers around, we have big crowds, some conversations going on. And in one of the uh, speech zones, there's a man holding a sign that says, it's okay to celebrate white culture. White shaming is not okay. So first of all, what's your name and what's the message? Uh, my name is Scott, and the message is exactly what my sign says. It's okay to celebrate white culture, but so white shaming is not okay. This is in response to uh, church's uh, message uh, during Charlottesville that uh, they said white culture or white supremacy is not in standing with church doctrine. Uh, I agree with white supremacy, of course, but white culture is not. A, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not a sin. And uh, I feel that they were uh, just giving in to kind of the Europhobic culture of the day. You know, and I think uh, whites and white people too often, our culture is shamed. We're not given the same respect that blacks and Mexicans and other minorities are to celebrate their race or celebrate their culture. And so i just out here reminding uh, people, you know, I have respect for all races, all cultures. I'm just out here responding what reminding white people that they have nothing to be ashamed of because um, whites have done a lot for the world of, of people of all races. What's your religious background? What's your worldview? Uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I'm an active member and I regard the uh, prophet and apostles as a prophet and apostles. Um, but uh, with that statement, I disagree with the Church Public Affairs Office and uh, I think uh, they were misguided, the Church Public Affairs Department. In the same vein of topics, what's your view of what the church did prior to 19, sorry, is it 78, 1978, with the lifting of the priesthood restriction on blacks? Uh, I, I, you know, I, of course, think that's great. That's uh, a little confusing why that policy was implemented since Joseph Smith um, gave the priesthood to some blacks, but then later on they didn't, so I don't know if that was um, Brigham Young trying to just focus on whites at the time or a misunderstanding of racial doctrine at the time or relation from God or what, but, you know, I do celebrate that uh, all worthy members can receive the priesthood today. Do you think that the leadership was wrong to teach that blacks had been less valiant or not valiant in the premortal life? I, that's a good question. I mean, I don't really believe it today, and I think it's just misunderstanding in the past because I mean I have a, a lot of black friends and they're great guys faithful members you know there's no difference between them and me so it does seem to be though the theological justification they gave for the priesthood ban do you think that they were engaging in false teaching when they promoted that view uh, like I said I'm I, I probably need to do more research on it but today you know they enjoy the priesthood and I don't see you know, they seem, I mean, we're all equal, so God loves all his children regardless of skin color. Let me throw a thought experiment to you. Let's say that Latter-day Saints are correct in teaching that there's a pre-mortal existence. And let's say that in the council in heaven, so to speak, white people, people with white skin, uh, were not valiant and uh, did not choose Christ's plan and we're sent here with the curse of white skin this is a hypothetical of course and uh, then the gospel is preached and um, but we're told by the Latter-day Saints for a period of time that because our skin signifies a lack of valiance and premortality that we can't enjoy being full citizens of the kingdom of God uh, what would you think of that uh, like I said, I'd, if the same thing happened to whites, I, th I think it sounds more like a misunderstanding of past uh, doctrine and past scripture. And so, uh, yeah. What's the connection or the relationship between worthiness and enjoying the benefits of being a citizen of the kingdom of God? In, the, in other words, uh, what relevance does worthiness have when it comes to those kinds of things? Uh, this good question reminds me of that scripture. I forget the verse in the Bible that says, uh, "Neither uh, you know fornicators or revelers or those who um, defile themselves with mankind will inherit the kingdom of heaven." So obviously, worthiness is a prerequisite to entering the kingdom of heaven.
do you think that you will be worthy enough to enter into the celestial kingdom? Uh, I, I have faith that as I continue on the path in the faith in Jesus Christ and continue to repent and better my life, that I will be through the grace of God. How successful uh, do you have to be in worthiness to enter the celestial kingdom? Uh, that's a good question because even that uh, woman who committed adultery, uh, when all the Jews wanted to stone her and Jesus says, well, let him who has no sin cast the first stone and and the woman, you know, of course, was very thankful, and he says, go and sin no more. And so I think uh, what's important to God, you know, based on that and other scriptures, is that we don't give up and we continue to come closer to him and repent of our sins. So I guess I'd ask again, how successful do you have to be at that in order to enter the celestial kingdom? What's the standard of celestial law or celestial living that is the prerequisite for celestial exaltation? Uh, probably fully living the commandments of God, but of course God will be the final judge, so it's hard to say what percentage of the commandments you keep that is required or whatnot, or, you know, conversion of your heart. So probably a better question for God, I guess. The men, the men here and his spokespeople, they do their best to uh, enforce what he commands, though. So try this on and tell me what you think. According to the Bible, our worthiness has nothing to do in terms of prerequisite achievement for entering the kingdom of God or entering into celestial glory, being with Heavenly Father. The gospel is not that worthy people may earn exaltation. The gospel is that none is worthy. Everyone is 0% worthy. In that in order to enter into the kingdom of God, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> my voice is tired, we have to declare a kind of religious bankruptcy and acknowledge our 0% worthiness before God. So the gift that God offers those who declare religious bankruptcy and trust in the free gift of Christ's salvation and eternal life the gift is to be counted 100% worthy and 100% righteous and 0% guilty and then being given a permanent relationship with God and a seal and a promise that one will spend eternity with God forever. What are your thoughts and opinions on that? Uh, I think you kind of said what I did, but in different words. Um, like I said, I was talking about uh, so long as we repent, uh, we'll be counted worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, which you kind of mentioned is, well, uh, you know, we're 0% worthy right now, but we'll be counted 100% worthy um, upon repentance, although you didn't mention repentance. Um, but I, implicitly. 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 But a different kind of repentance, the repentance that says, I can't earn or prove myself worthy of God's presence. Yeah, right, I agree. That's uh, why we have to rely on the grace of Christ. Because no matter what we do, we're, we'll still be un counted unworthy. Uh, we'll still be with sin. Um, but because of his grace and his love for us, he'll wipe that slate clean. Have you ever heard of a temp agency uh, with yeah. getting a job? Yeah. What's your understanding of what a temp agency is? So if it's, I'm leading you somewhere. There's one more question after that. Yeah, yeah. You are, that's fine. Uh, of course, just temporary employment. So you go to a temp agency and someone aids or assists you in putting your resume together, maybe gathering a skill set, and applying for jobs. And so you might go to a temp agency out of necessity, uh, not, not you in particular, I'm not saying uh, you're in need of that, but one might go to a temp agency and receive gracious help and assistance from a worker at such an institution, and then successfully get a job, and then earn their own paycheck. Now, another metaphor would be the welfare office. And that's very different. The welfare office is for people who are more destitute, <clears throat> who are unable to um, earn a living, who are unable to prove themselves marketable, uh, for people who are in pretty bad shape. 
the gospel is nothing like a temp agency, and it's entirely like a welfare agency, because in order to be received into a relationship with God, we have to stop approaching him as though he's merely assisting us in being worthy enough or righteous enough or earning enough uh, creds. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think it's a good idea, good example. Um, God, after all, is our Father and Jesus Christ, our older brother. And so um, just to merely look at them for what they can give us as a handout or help is uh, probably kind of selfish. Um, but just uh, loving them because they, because they love us, you know, I think that's probably a better relationship, right? So if this is true, if the gospel is free and the gift of righteousness and the gift of being counted 100% worthy is a free gift, and if my benefit of being in the kingdom of God with other believers is a free gift received freely, why in the world would anyone say that my skin color or my lack of valiance or worthiness in the pre-mortality is even relevant to my position in the kingdom of God? Do you understand the spirit of the question? It's not, it's, this part particular question isn't a critique of the uh, black doctrine, although I have big critiques of what the LDS Church taught about that. But this particular critique is, why would a true apostle think that past worthiness is even relevant to my participation in the community of God's people? Um, well, I think it was more they thought the past worthiness was more of a you know, they to participate but not enjoy the full benefits such as priesthood for the men. Even though today, you know, we don't give women the priesthood just like they didn't in the Bible times. But I think, like I said, I think it was... But that's not done because of a sense of women being less worthy, right? right but, right. The, but the black ban was justified by appealing to a supposed lack of premortal worthiness, right? I, I believe so, um, from what I've read. Uh, but like I said, I, th I think it's more due to uh, culture of the time and understanding of the different races and uh, based on past scripture. Um, I believe there's one in the Bible where it kind of insinuates uh, that blacks were less loyal like the Mark of Cain or something like Never. that. Never. The Mark of Cain was actually uh, not black skin and it was actually a blessing. Uh, it was to protect him from being killed as he went out as a vagabond. Right, but he was still cursed by God for his murdering his brother. Not with skin. Okay, but uh, well, like I said, I thought I believe that they took they assumed that's what it meant, and so the it sounds like you just you took that position too, right? Or am I misunderstanding you? No, I'm just saying what I believe was their understanding. So to me, it sounded like that's what they understood at the time, because um, like I said, the racial understanding of the different races is, races you know a hundred years ago was different than the understanding we have today, and the equality of cultures and wealth and power was also very, you know, a lot more unequal back in the past. And so often that was justified, oh, it's because, you know, they're different race because they really didn't have much else to go on, you know. The racism there deserves, a, I hope you agree, a pretty vigorous and harsh critique. That, was, that racism you just spoke of was pretty gross. But even more of a problem is this sense that blacks were not fully invited to participate in the life of what was supposed to be God's church because of a lack of previous worthiness. So I guess my point is, not to repeat hopefully too much, my point is that if you really understand the gospel, the whole notion of previous worthiness is irrelevant to whether someone can fully participate in the kingdom of God and his people. So it seems like pretty clearly that when Mormon prophets and apostles took that position they did so out of a gross contradiction to the gospel of the New Testament uh, in the new in the first century you had Gentiles with their own culture right Greek culture you had Palestinian Jews who had their own culture right but what was it that united them in Christ what what brought them to the same table the gospel and how did they receive that 
in such a way that made them equal? Uh, uh, I don't. How do they receive it? The, the same. I don't, I don't. What? So, I, okay, I'll I'll just say it. In the book of Galatians, Paul teaches that both Jews and Gentiles are justified. Does that term have a significance in your Latter Day Saint uh, culture? Um, probably. I haven't researched it much, though, so I'd have to research it to talk more about it. No worries. Justification means to be counted as righteous, uh, much like a courtroom proceeding that says not guilty or righteous. Justification is the declaration that a person is both not guilty and is in the right. So to be counted or reckoned or considered righteous, 100% righteous before God, that gift of justification is received by both Jews and Gentiles as a free gift by a desperate, empty-handed, childlike faith in a sense that one is not worthy at all. So what brought Jews and Gentiles to the same table, working together to eat food that would make their fellowship compatible because they had really deep food laws that were, they were really sensitive about, what brought them together was a sense that the gospel of forgiveness no! and justification came by grace, through faith, not by skin color, not by culture, not by historical or pre-mortal worthiness or even present worthiness. So the stark reality is the Latter-day Saint tradition was pretty flagrantly contradicting the very heart of the gospel when it's prophets and apostles were teaching that prior lack of worthiness signified by skin color was even relevant to the question of full equal participation at the table of God's people and the full benefits and blessings of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I already answered that question multiple times. Yeah, I think we're repeating ourselves. It's gospel stuff, so... It's worth repeating. Do you believe that Latter-day Saints and historic Christians have the same basic gospel message? Yes. And can you, in your own words, say, what is the basic gospel message? Basic gospel message is uh, basically, you know, you believe on Christ and follow him, you can be saved in the kingdom of heaven. Does the Latter-day Saint faith to find it merely like that? Uh, that's in general. Uh, the gospel components that we describe are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism by immersion, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end. Which I assume entails participation in the temple rituals? Uh, if, if they're available, yes. I believe in ancient times, uh, temple rituals were not always available to saints in different parts of the world. Um, but, you know, those blessings would be available one day. For someone like you or me who is either married or marriageable or uh, able to go to a temple, um, it sounds like in the Latter-day Saint tradition to truly follow the gospel and endure to the end and be f fully accepted, really, one has to participate in all the temple ordinances. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes, if they're available in your area, or if, if you can make it to one and are counted worthy. So, if I understand you correctly from previous comments, that would entail keeping all the commandments. It would entail participating in all of the requirements of the LDS Church on its people, participating in all the temple ordinances, and doing so with an adequate amount of success that matches celestial law. Is that fair? Uh, kind of close, but uh, I mean, of course, we all sin and we all uh, make mistakes. So in the end, it comes down to the grace of God, right? Received by bankrupt, desperate, empty-handed, childlike faith, not by temple rituals or membership in a particular church, 
or a sense that I can be worthy and prove myself worthy in this mortal probation of God's plan. All right. Well, thanks for your time. I'm going to head out. Thanks for talking with me. Yeah.